We are recording. There we go. It's great to see everybody. Thank you all for joining tonight. Uh, Welcome to our Listen and Learn webinar. It, this is about LGBTQ youth and supporting them and how we can support them and, and their families. Um, so we hope you learn a lot tonight. Um, I am Courtney Shreve and I'm the mentor program liaison for the school district, North Thurston Public Schools. And I'm also the proud parent of two LGBTQ young adults who attended North Thurston Public Schools. Um, We've got a great panel, as, as you can see, or you will see them soon if you can't, and uh, videos planned for the first hour of this, followed by an opportunity to answer your questions. Um, and all you need to do is at the bottom, type them in um, as you have them. Just know that we won't answer them until the end, and we'll try to get to everybody's questions. Um, but if we don't, um, we've got your emails, and we could send you answers to those questions. So um, I'm co-hosting here with Jennifer, who will introduce herself in a bit, but I'm going to turn this over with, uh, to Dr. Antonio Sandifer, who is our Director of Equity and Languages. Good evening, everyone. As she said, I'm Dr. Antonio Sandifer, the Director of Equity and Languages for the North Thurston School District, and we are honored and happy that you all are supporting our LGBT community tonight. And tonight is an evening of information where we hope to learn and grow more about this community and be able to support. So at this time, I want us to do a land acknowledgement from the North Thurston Public Schools. I have a Courtney, if you don't have it. Uh, uh, oh, you do? Go ahead then. We acknowledge that North Thurston Public School resides on the traditional lands of the Nisqually people. The Nisqually have lived on and cared for this land and these waterways since time immemorial. We make this, this acknowledgement to open a space of recognition, inclusion, and respect for our sovereign tribal partners and all indigenous students, families, and staff in our community. I also would like to take the time for us to acknowledge our ancestors who have paved the way that so each and every one of us could be here as well from our various cultural backgrounds. So again, thank y'all so much for being here and I hope you learn and grow a lot tonight. Back to you, Courtney. Thank you, Antonio. I'll turn it over to Jennifer. And I was doing technology stuff. Did you mention the Community Cafe on June 2nd? Thank you, I did not. <laughs> so uh, after this um, forum tonight, we will be having a Community Cafe on June the 2nd. And it would be, where is that at, Courtney? That will be at Chinook Middle School. And uh, you can register for that online as well. And it's in person. So um... thank you. Well, hello. Uh, my name is Jennifer Valera, and I teach at Aspire Performing Arts Academy. And I also facilitate our Gay Straight Alliance there. Um, I am also a member of the LGBTQ plus community. I identify as a lesbian and I'm the parent of two children ages eight and 10 and my 10 year old identifies as gender fluid. So that's a little bit about me. Um, what I'm gonna share with you first off is a part of my Gay Straight Alliance students pride assembly slideshow. Uh, so every year they put together an assembly to celebrate pride and to educate other students about the meaning of pride. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull that up. So we start with kind of the basics, which is the acronym, right? What do all these letters mean? And this is student created. Um, so starting with the L, lesbian, a woman who's attracted to women, um, G for gay, a man who's attracted to men. It's also an umbrella term often used um, to um, represent anybody attracted to the same gender. Um, they define bisexual as someone who's attracted to two genders. Transgender as a person whose gender identity differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, Q for queer often as an umbrella term, really reclaimed slur was once used as a slur, reclaimed by the community as an umbrella term to represent anyone who doesn't identify as heterosexual or cisgender. It can also represent questioning for um, individuals who are questioning their sexuality or gender identity. 
Um, I for intersex, another umbrella term for differences in sex traits or reproductive anatomy. And then the letter A has a few different um, meanings. It can stand for ally, aromantic, asexual. Um, so the idea of the aromantic is not experiencing romantic attraction, asexual not experiencing sexual attraction. And of course, an ally is someone who supports the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and then the plus recognizes many other letters that aren't in the basic acronym. A really important one, um, because many of our students identify this way, is non-binary, which is someone who does not identify with the gender binary. Um, so that's an overview of the acronym. And let me go ahead and stop sharing. The next thing we're going to see is a short video uh, from one of my students, Onyx, who is an eighth grade student at Aspire. Um, Onyx is co-president of the Gay Straight Alliance, and this is just an example of their um, student voice around how parents can best support LGBTQIA plus students. So I'm going to let Courtney go ahead and play that video. Oh, and I, I hear the volume on it is a little quiet. So if you're having trouble hearing, you might want to turn your sound all the way up. So Onyx, how do you think parents can best support LGBTQIA plus youth? Um, well, I think that they should ask like lots of questions either to like the child or like find credible sources so they can learn more and so they can do their best to like with this knowledge then support the child and um, listen, like if, a, if the child tells you that this is who they are, this is how they identify, don't tell them, no, you're not, you're this because I raised you to be that. That's not true. They are who they are, and no matter what, you can't just change that. And if of a, if their identity does change, support them anyways. Don't say, no, you said this. Well, this is what they're telling you now. Just if they tell you that's how who they are and what they identify as, then support them. And um, if they're comfortable with it, help them tell other people. Like, if your child is trans, remind other people about any name or pronoun changes and don't just go along with it because it's respectful. Tell them so your child can feel safe in the environment they're in. Now, I know you have very supportive parents. Do you know any other um, LGBTQIA plus students who don't have supportive parents and what is their experience like? Um, all my friends that like don't have supportive parents feel uncomfortable telling their family about who they are and a lot of them just haven't come out or when they have come out they've been forced to go back into the closet and say oh wait no I was wrong and pretend to be the perfect straight kid that their parent wants them to be and it they they're not happy they're like clearly sad that their parents won't support them for who they are and it, like takes a bad effect on your mental health to have like your closest family members like deny you who you are and it's just it's horrible seeing that people are out there like not supporting their kids and the effect that it has on their kids. Thanks, Jennifer. And if you joined us a little bit late, um, the question and answer, just type your question in the Q&A and we will get to that at the end of the meeting. Hopefully people are able to hear. We are recording it so you can view it later if you have technical difficulties. Now we've got another video um, that we are going to share, kind of an overall look at, at why we're having this uh, webinar tonight. My son told me he kept who he was a secret for years. I wish I had known what he wanted to say. A student told me at a pretty young age that they didn't want to be referred to as either he or she. I had to practice using different words for them. When she was a young adult and told me that she had feelings for another girl, she said she always knew this, but was afraid to talk about it. I love her so much. 
At first, she was holding hands with her friend because that's what young girls do. Then she was bullied for it, and I didn't understand what was happening. I wish I'd known more. These are the voices of adults who care about young people who identify as LGBTQ. LGBTQ stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer questioning. Youth who identify as any of these orientations or statuses are at significantly increased risk for mental health problems, bullying and other violence, homelessness, substance use disorder, and even suicidal thoughts or behaviors. Because of the vulnerability of LGBTQ youth, it's critical for adults to be mindful of ways to better listen to the voices of these young people. Keep a few simple ideas in mind. Developmental stages. Friendships form in childhood, and romantic attractions in others can begin in adolescence. For adolescents, a desire for friendship or a closer connection with another person is normal. Pay attention to how and when the young people in your life express their romantic attention to others. How they want to express themselves at this point in their lives may include their identity as LGBTQ. Cultural influences. People receive messages from friends, family, their communities, and the media about what is acceptable. Negative messages about LGBTQ identity can be a significant reason that talking about their personal lives can be so hard. Being open to who they are and who they want to be can be the most difficult experience of their young lives. Identity and pronouns. LGBTQ youth may choose their own pronouns because of their feelings about the intersection between culture and gender. Many have chosen to use non-gendered pronouns, such as they or their, in order to avoid using gender identifiers, she, her, or he, him. Their choices should be respected and practiced by others, as it is a language shift that is important to a young person. Biology. LGBTQ youth will often discuss how their biological influences affect who they are attracted to and how they want to live their lives. These influences impact decisions about friendships, partners, social circles, clothes, and where and how they want to live their lives as adults. All of these factors are dealt with carefully and cautiously. Biology plays an important role for a person who may identify as LGBTQ. Parents, teachers, coaches, clergy, community leaders, and other adults have the opportunity to listen to LGBTQ youth. Children and adolescents often express themselves according to the expectations of their home communities and cultures. The hope for all is supportive, caring, non-judgmental environment. LGBTQ youth who are at increased risk for mental health and other problems can be offered confidence, safety, and security in who they are and how they express themselves by a trusted adult who is willing to listen to them. True listening means there is always help and there is always hope. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our guest from PFLAG, and I'm not sure which of you is going first. Dana, Diane, take it away. I got it. Hi, everyone, thanks for joining us. So PFLAG, PFLAG was started back in 1973. It originally was called Parents, Families, and friends of gays and lesbians. And in 2014, the organization changed and we simply go by the acronym of PFLAG now because it, there's a wider umbrella that we're involving and including. Um, I started coming to PFLAG when my son was experiencing some depression and some behavioral issues. And it was because he hadn't come out yet. So once he came out, um, I started going to PFLAG we meet once a month, and I've been going since 2013. We meet once a month. We have support groups. We usually try to have an educational piece in there. Um, it gives parents a place to go to ask all the questions they're wanting to ask. It's more appropriate to go and ask the questions amongst others that have already experienced it. It's not your child's responsibility to answer these questions. They've already, if they've come out to you, they're already at that point, you're responsible to educate yourself. So that's what PFLAG provided for me. Um, 
we meet second Sunday of the month in Olympia at 2 p.m. We are starting to go back in person, but there's chapters all over the place. There's a chapter in Tacoma that meets, I believe, on Thursday nights. Um, so if, if you're this isn't the local area you're living in, you're able to find a chapter somewhere else as well. Um, Diane is my secretary. She's been on the board. We've both been on the board for several years now. My son's the uh, also on the board. Diane. Um, yeah, I started coming to Key Flag a long time ago um, when my daughter Hillary came out to me. Um, she's a lesbian. Um, my brother actually came out to me first. And at that time, um, I didn't know what to think, right? I, I, I didn't want to think about it. I love my brother and um, that never stopped. But once my daughter came out to me, I had to think about it. I had to figure out the truth for myself. Um, so uh, PFLAG uh, very much helped with that. Um, I think the first uh, meeting I went to, uh, Dr. Patrick Chapman from South Puget Sound Community College was there. Um, he, was, he wrote a book called Thou Shalt Not Love, What Evangelicals Really Say to Gays. That helped me just reading this book by a scientist who was raised evangelical, who went through reparative therapy. Um, so that's all it took for me, but I kept going to PFLAG. And at one time, me and my daughter and my boyfriend uh, were all on the, the board. So um, yeah, <laughs> thanks. But let me say this, PFLAG has evolved through the years. What started as a strictly parent-based group is not that so it's not so anymore our board is a mixture um and our attendees are, at, are as well so when we get together we'll have a program on something but then we'll split off into separate support groups so that allows the straight individuals to go into one area to ask their questions openly um, everything that we discuss there is educational. So if somebody says something inappropriate or you can say it any way you want and we're gonna answer your question and then explain why the way you ask that could be offensive, okay? It's the best learning place. But then our LGBTQ plus have an area to go and share and have support as well together. So that's pretty much it, Courtney. Do you got any questions? No, I think folks may have questions later, but uh, if you Google PFLAG Olympia, all the information is there. They've got a Facebook page. Thank you both for being here tonight and uh, got another video for you. So sit back and enjoy. Gotta find my share thing. There we go. My name is Marsha Izumi. I'm from Pasadena, California. Hola, soy Anton Castellano Susigli, uh, originalmente México. Robert A. Marchman from Maplewood, New Jersey. Palm Desert, California. Baltimore, Maryland. Berkeley, California. They come to PFLAG in crisis. Their life is falling apart because their child is coming out. I initially got involved in PFLAG because my son was withdrawn, depressed, and suicidal and I didn't know where to turn. She comes home and says, Mom, I'm transgender. And I said, okay, are you sure? I said, I said, you know, we're gonna move forward. How hard it must have been to navigate a gender journey with a teenager. Well, Mom, it may not be a big deal to you, but it's a big deal to me. And that was one of those moments that I will never forget. I was aware of the painful experience of many LGBTQ people of color, um, and that was something that um, was frankly painful for me. We had to reconcile having our new normal, which was our gay son, with what anti-gay messages were coming out of the Southern Baptist Convention at that time. My child was the first one to transition in our public schools, and she was pretty badly bullied, so having some friends in the PFLAG community really meant the world to my family. 
la primera vez que escuché PFLAG fue a través de un mentor en la Ciudad de México que me enseñó el poder que los papás de personas LGBTQ pueden tener como activistas por la igualdad y por los derechos humanos. PFLAG uh, is on a journey of not only educating itself, but educating others so that we can be in a place where we can gain equality for the entire LGBT community. As an educational resource, uh, PFLAG is the only thing that's out there for families like mine. I want to bring um, the message to communities of color and uh, black and brown communities that this is an organization, that PFLAG is an organization that um, can support the community. All the people that spend all the time and all the hours learning, training, sharing, telling their stories, like literally without the human connection, none of this would be possible and none of this would work. We all seek to belong to something that is greater than ourselves. And, and, and PFLAG has given me that opportunity. By being out and proud and an advocate, I could actually be potentially a role model or a sounding board or, um, or somehow just make some kid's life a little bit easier. As a PFLAG dad, a proud PFLAG dad, to be an advocate for my son, who I love dearly, um, is something that's very special and uh, important to me. It's the screen test for anybody who's dating, anybody in our family. It's like, you can't be a part of our family unless you pass the PFLAG test. <laughs> PFLAG made it possible for my family to stay together. So no matter what other people say, no matter what you may hear from those other people and other places that say something different, don't even give them a second thought because we love you just as you are. Baby, you, my child, I love you and you are walking in those shoes. I'm just here to love and support you and this is how we will move forward, so. All right. Thank you. Um, Next up, we have Cassandra, and I will let Cassandra introduce herself. So much pressure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, let me share my... Oh, there we go. Okay, so... Um, so my name is Cassandra Charles Quirk. I am a facilitator at Lambert House, which is located in Seattle, Washington. It is an actual house, spoiler there. Uh, I'm also a, currently a grad uh, school student at Social Welfare School at University of Washington. Uh, as you can tell, I'm a little bit older than the average student, uh, but my background before going back to school was in middle management, so don't Hold that against me too bad. Uh, and I also have a pretty large background in transgender activism. I've been in the really actually over 30 years of working in the LGBTQI plus community. Uh, most of my background though is actually in the arts. Uh, I came out in the 1990s, which you can imagine as a trans person was a bit of a challenge. There weren't that many resources. Uh, the internet was not really a thing uh, in the very early 90s for most people. So uh, it was a little bit of a challenge to find information. And now it's, it's great that there's so much information, but unfortunately a lot of the same challenges uh, for you still uh, are the same, you know, even so many years later. So Lambert House, just real quick, I'm gonna kind of blaze through some of this since we don't have a whole ton of time. Uh, it's, it's a house that empowers LGBTQ youth uh, through development of leadership, social and life skills. What they've found through a lot of research is for, uh, a queer child that having just one adult who is a mentor and a positive force in their lives makes a huge difference. It literally makes the difference between life and death. A lot of times kids still get kicked out of the house for being gay or being trans. It happens all the time, even in very left-leaning cities like Seattle. Uh, it's very surprising. And a lot of kids who are much more likely to be in crisis are usually kids who are gay or, or lesbian or bisexual or trans. 
So um, I want to kind of show this kind of to add upon when we talk about what those LGBTQ factors mean. And it's, uh, you may have seen this before, it's called the gender unicorn. And the thing I really want to kind of stress here is when we talk about gender identity, gender expression, the sex you're assigned at birth when you're born, who you're attracted to, and who you're emotionally attracted to, those are all different things. And sometimes this gets kind of pushed into a soup. And it gets a little confusing for folks who maybe aren't around uh, rainbow folks so often. So, you know, gender identity is what you feel like inside. So even though the rapper may lie to the norms of society, it's what you feel like you are. It's how you feel like you want to express yourself. Gender expression also is how you dress. If you imagine... I'm going to start dating myself here with these references, but like, I'm a big David Bowie fan. So like David Bowie was somewhat androgynous in his expression or somebody like Prince who Prince was a cis male who, as far as we know, was heterosexual, but he dressed very effeminately in a lot of ways. And he wore high heels. He wore heels much nicer than heels that I'll ever own. Uh, so those are those different things. And just because you're assigned a sex at birth, does not necessarily mean that's going to match with your identity or, or expression as kids grow and they get older. And that also has nothing to do with who you're attracted to. You know, transgender women can be attracted to straight hetero cis men. Uh, the, the combinations are just infinite to these things. But the important thing to just remember and really nail down is these are all separate things. So because someone is trans doesn't mean they're gay. It doesn't mean they're straight. They could be a lot of different things. They can be all things. They can be no, nothing. They could be right dead in the middle. It's almost, if you think of it as like a yardstick, you know, not anyone is totally masculine except maybe the rock. Okay. And no one's like totally feminine except maybe like Dolly Parton, right? Everyone's kind of somewhere, you know, along that needle, right? It's, it's not all or everything. So we talked a little bit about pronouns earlier, but why do people want specific pronouns? Well, honestly, that doesn't really matter. You know, it's, it's whatever they want or whatever they prefer is what we should respect. In a social work context, we always, always like to think about the client is the expert. So what the client prefers or what their narrative is or their experiences, they're the experts on their lives. So if somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, I prefer these pronouns, then you take them at the word. That's what they want to do. And they may evolve over time. They may change over time, especially with youth. We see a lot of that at Lambert House. And right now we're kind of in this renaissance of pronoun evolution and revolution. Everything changes, you know, things that were seemed like science fiction when I was a kid are now commonplace. You know, we have a, we have a supercomputer in our pocket we carry around with us every single day. Uh, so things change and that's okay. That can be a good thing sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes when things change and evolve. I always tell parents and just people in general, if you're in doubt, use they, them as a pronoun baseline. If you're, if you're not sure, uh, or just in general, it, it's kind of amazing how we genderize everything in society still. Like, why, why do we call ships women? That makes no sense to me. It's just, you know, those kind of things. It's really funny if you stop to think about gendered language and common day, or day products um, or processes. You know, it's, it's a show of respect and self-worth. The number one issue I see regarding respect and self-esteem and youth that leads to like depression for them is not respecting their pronouns. It's it's something they talk about every single day. It makes them crazy. It makes them upset. It makes them sad. It even makes them suicidal. It's a big, big thing uh, to respect those pronouns. And it's not a trend. You know, they're, why are so many kids now coming out? Why do you see so much stuff about like non-binary folks now? Well, it's because there is simply more information out there now for youth and they're finding each other through the internet. Uh, and there's more terminology for them to express how they feel. You know, the term transgender didn't exist when I came out. You know, I came out and I was labeled as transsexual, which is almost kind of an old school term now. So these are six action steps you can take that I always recommend that are a really good just kind of habit to have as kind of going forward if you want to support your LGBTQ child. Um, 
if you're a cisgender, if you express yourself in the gender in which you were born, that the doctor said you're a boy and you're still considering yourself masculine and you dress in the suit or whatnot or the t-shirt, um, always introduce yourself with your pronouns. It helps normalize the use of pronouns and prevents assumptions. Uh, you see a lot of times people with pins, I think Courtney has a pin on now, I can't quite tell, uh, but you see those pins a lot of times on there that discuss people's pronouns. And those are great. We see a lot of those um, now, especially down at the UW campus. You may hear pronouns you're unfamiliar with, and you can look them up on the internet or you can practice what they sound like. And this is just really the evolution of pronouns. A lot of times, even though I'm surrounded with career youth, they'll come up with pronouns that are really kind of surprising to me. There's, all, there's this kind of idea to reclaim the pronoun it with youth right now, which is actually kind of shocking because that, that, that's kind of insulting to me, but it, it's what's kind of going on right now. Just don't assume because someone looks or presents a certain way that that's the pronouns that they use. When in doubt, you can always ask in a private space, but always start the conversation if you're going to have that conversation with introducing your own pronouns. It really helps kind of break the ice there. What happens when you misgender somebody? Well, it happens all the time. I do it. I work almost extensively with queer youth on a day-to-day -day basis, and I misgender kids all the time. Just apologize, you know, correct yourself, just like if you had mispronounced someone's name and just move on and maybe promise to try to do better in the future. Uh, if someone corrects you on a pronoun usage, just say thank you and correct yourself and just move on. It's just that simple, just like any apology. Uh, you know, we have a really hard time apologizing in society today, like a real apology, you know. So restrain yourself from saying, you know, I'm sorry if you were offended. No, I don't do that. Just apologize and move on. Uh, you can watch all sorts of videos. There's a lot of great information online about topics if you're interested. And, and look inside organizations that you may be a member of, you know, not just schools, but churches, or in, even in your workplace. And think about neutral language. Um, see if there's a policy that supports kind of more of a neutral language, you know, and, and it's, this is all evolving. I, I can't really stress that enough. And it's, it's going to continue to evolve as time goes on. Intersectionality is kind of a big topic. And I'm going to try to break it down in a very quick amount of time because we don't have very much time. Uh, but intersectionality is this idea that we are all multifaceted, essentially, you know, obviously I'm Caucasian, um, but I'm a trans woman, but I'm also a lesbian. Um, I'm also an atheist. So all these things, you know, my class, you know, where I came from, my culture, uh, my dad is British. So that's kind of part of it. It's all kind of part of this intersectionality. But, you know, gender is an, it's a, it's a construct that society has created. It's not Gender is not real, and that kind of blows people away, and they like to get very argumentative. But if you think about trends and things, you know, go back to Prince with his ruffled shirts, right? Or I think that like pink was a color that used to be considered very, very masculine. Or you look at um, pre-revolutionary France, how the men used to dress. They, they dress like drag queens, essentially, you know, and that was considered to be very masculine, you know, powdered wigs and and Britain and the legal system. You know, all these things are a construct that we've created and culturally can be very different. Now, with intersectionality, though, sexual orientation and gender and data, although they sometimes overlap and cross over with each other, again, they're not the same thing. Sexual orientation is who you love. Gender identity is who you are. And gender identity can be a big spectrum. There's a lot of judgment and tropes around gender identity and sexual orientation. And these tropes can do harm. You know, uh, representation in films and movies and stuff. And you see a lot of times people were really fighting for that. It's because there still isn't really a lot of great representation. When I was a kid, like in the seventies and eighties, if there was a gay character, they were usually always a stereotype or they were the villain or they were the first person who Freddy Krueger was gonna kill in that movie. Uh, you know, a trans person was always trying to trick somebody. You know, they were a trickster. They were, tried, they were up to no good, kind of like, I don't know, like Silence of the Lambs or something. They were like a serial killer. I really like this quote, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. And that's kind of how I look at the whole queer spectrum. It's, it's actually a quote from Star Trek. I apologize for being a gigantic nerd, but it's, 
it's really good to think about the fact that there is just an infinite combination and, you know, everyone is different and that's a good thing. You know, the, earlier this week, I had to confess, I had a situation with my youth who tried to commit suicide and it, it was really hard, you know, obviously to think about those kind of things. Cause otherwise this is such a bright young person and, um, uh, you know, I'm going to try not to get upset about it, but it's when I came out of the closet, my parents, my parents are extremely Roman Catholic. Uh, they were shot and they were also pretty upset. But the one thing my mom said right from the get go is that she said, I have three children. I don't have enough to lose one. So I'm a big nerd. I'm a big goofball. I still am even after I came out of the closet. Uh, so it's still the same kid, no matter what. And again, the importance of having just one supportive adult, one adult who's nurturing for that kid and still loves that kid, that's huge. That kid really saved that kid's life. You know, if you look at, we have an infographic here on the side, hopefully you can see it, that, you know, half of transgender youth will have at least one suicide tip by their 20th birthday. Uh, we see a lot of not just bullying, and uh, passive aggressive behavior towards especially trans and non-binary youth, but also huge amounts of depression. They're much more likely to be homeless. Uh, they're most, much more likely to drop out of school, um, get into substance abuse and, and all sorts of terrible things. And a lot of that can be remedied by a supportive household or a supportive community or environment or that one adult. Um, there's just a huge connection between respecting the kid and that they know what they're talking about and they are aware of their situation and believing who they are and their success as an adult and their happiness as they move forward. Uh, courage and not confusion. That's how I always look at it when a kid comes out, that they're not confused. Kids are smarter than you think they are, and especially Sometimes I talk to 12 or 13 year old kids at Lambert House and they act like they're on their fourth divorce. They're so insightful. I, I don't know whether they get this knowledge sometimes. Um, and things like current legal issues, uh, stories in the media, which unfortunately um, trans people are now the new boogeyman um, for a lot of these laws and these kind of, uh, you know, we'll just call it like right wing, like extreme right wing roof points that affects those kids. It affects those kids seriously. They're aware of this. They, they hear they're not isolated from all these things. And uh, some of this stuff is terrifying these kids and it's going to affect them in, in ways that are pretty profound emotionally. Uh, there's a burden being true to yourself. You know, I did not go through coming out and losing friends and family and spending a lot of money on surgery, uh, losing jobs, uh, surviving a suicide attempt because I thought it'd be fun. I did it because I had to do this to survive. I had to transition to be myself. And even though you did not know me when I was 21, I guarantee you, I'm a very, very different person. I'm happy. I'm healthy. You know, I live in a beautiful home. Uh, I marry a lovely wife. I have a 29 year old child who is also healthy and happy. Um, all these things are possible. And I have a great relationship with my parents now. And it's because I came out, uh, I'm a much more upbeat person. I'll just put it that way. Uh, and there are a lot of problems with facing the norms of society. When anyone goes against the norms of society and we're a little shelter here in Seattle, um, and the further out you go, it can be harder and harder in rural areas. We see a lot of kids come in from rural areas at Lambert House that they're the ones who usually have the biggest problems because they don't have that support network because maybe um, it's a little more conservative in those areas. So you can see some of these statistics again with suicide, which are pretty eye-opening and should be pretty important for people to look at. So how do you create that positive and welcoming atmosphere? You can just be part of the solution and be a true ally. And to be a true ally is to do what you say. You speak up when someone is saying something or harassing someone. Um, you can do it by micro level change. What that means is you help one kid at a time. You listen to that one kid. You respect that one kid. Listen to their pronouns and their perspectives because Supporting that one child who is struggling, that actually leads to bigger change within the system. You can continue to educate yourself. 
um, by seeing what the new trends are, the evolution. Uh, again, use your voice to advocate when you see harm or ignorance. And listen without judgment and accept that truth of the others. You know, we tend to have a lot of arbitrary bias as we get older. I think it's just normal. You know, we, we think about the good old days of, you know, Nirvana or the Ramones and think how great it was. Well, it wasn't so great back then for a lot of people, especially wasn't for me growing up being trans. So uh, things to think about. So, you know, thanks. That's about all I have. Um, I know I kind of blazed through that, but I think just... The one thing to, to, if you remember anything from what I said, the client is the expert. So the child is the expert on their perspective and their life. They know what's going on with them. I knew at the age of six that I was trans, even though I couldn't emotionally, I didn't have the words, you know, I, I didn't have the vocabulary like to say it, but I knew what was going on. And uh, so sometimes maybe you have to draw it out of kids, but you just kind of watch. And you, when, when they're ready to say there's peace, please, please listen, because it's, it's vitally important. That's what I have. <laughs> I hope that was okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Cassandra. And um, yes, um, to some of the panelists, I'm aware, and I will work on that. Um, next up, we are going to have Sophia from Pizza Clutch. And I think we were going to, yeah, we were going to have you go first and then I'll do the video for you. Hi all, my name is Sophia. Um, I use they them pronouns and I'm the program manager at Pizza Clutch. Um, I've been with Pizza Clutch for about four years. Um, and if you don't know about Pizza Clutch, we'll be learning a little bit more with a short video that we'll be playing, um, but a little about me, I have been in the area for about 13 years now. Um, so Olympia forever, uh, Thurston County. I am happy to be here and I'm happy to be doing this work. And I am so excited that um, all of you are here, both panelists and um, everyone watching. So thank you for your support of our LGBTQ youth. Um, and Courtney is going to play a little video talking about Pizza Clutch. Thank you, I'm back. And... Pizza Clutch is a nonprofit organization based out of Olympia, Washington, that facilitates lunchtime support groups for LGBTQ plus youth at participating high schools in Thurston County. Clutches are held during lunchtime in a confidential space on school campuses and are run by trained LGBTQ plus facilitators. Students are in no way required to share their sexuality or gender identity to attend and all allies are welcome. Groups begin with students sharing their names, pronouns, and their high and low of the week. From there, every clatch is unique in the way that discussions center around the particular needs of the group of students in each clatch. The purpose of Pizza Clatch is to give our vulnerable LGBTQ youth an outlet to share their thoughts, feelings, and to gather access to resources around gender and sexuality. Our aim is to help reduce incidents of self-harm, suicidal ideation, and to promote resilience in our students. Our anonymous student surveys each year show that many students report a decrease increasing feelings of isolation and self-harm after attending Clatch. People often ask why we call Pizza Clatch Pizza Clatch, and the answer is that pizza is because of the free pizza we provide for the students, and Clatch is a Yiddish word meaning meetup or gathering. You might have heard the term coffee Clatch before. Also, it's much easier for young folks who are perhaps not out to family, friends, or even themselves to say, I'm going to Pizza Clutch today, rather than I'm going to a support group for queer and trans teens. Pizza Clutch began in 2007 as a response to a rash of suicides amongst LGBTQ plus teens in Thurston County. A group of LGBTQ plus licensed therapists, school administrators, and parents came together in the hope to find a way to better support the queer and trans youth of our community. Initially, they organized an after-school program with North Thurston High School, which was successful, but was unfortunately discontinued that year due to some students in attendance who were punished by their disapproving parents when they found out they stayed after school to attend an LGBTQ plus group. Thanks to the dedication of those original founders, as well as the support from the North Thurston School District and the students themselves, Pizza Clatch was able to move to lunchtime during the school day. And the very first slice at the very first Pizza Clatch lunchtime support group was served in the fall of 2008. 
Since then, Pizza Clutch has grown exponentially every year due to high demand and increasing need. As of 2019, our program was in all 14 public high schools of Thurston County, along with one middle school. Our team of staff and volunteer facilitators were running 28 clutches per week, supporting over 440 LGBTQ plus students on a weekly basis. Of course, those numbers changed drastically in 2020 along with many ways in which we were able to run our program. But we are still reaching out to students at each of our schools weekly via online clutches, and in the last few months started an online gaming group for PK students from all schools to socialize and play among us, amongst themselves. On behalf of the staff at Pizza Clatch, our amazing board of directors, and our absolutely incredible group of volunteers that have stuck with us through so much, All right. Sophia, is there anything else you want to follow up with there? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that that video is from last year. Um, so we are not doing the online support groups anymore because we are actually back physically in the schools, which has been amazing to be back um, and be seeing so many youth every week um, after a pretty rough couple years. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And now we will finish up our presentation with Joe from Glisten. Hello, everyone. Good to see everyone here today. Um, thank you um, for being here. And uh, my name is Joe Benno, and I volunteer with Glisten. Glisten, like P flag, changed our name. We used to be the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, and we decided not to go by that anymore. So we just go by the acronym Glisten because we wanted to make sure that we are inclusive of all, but also still keep our name. Um, I wear many hats. I volunteer with Glisten. I'm the chair of Glisten Washington, the statewide organization. That's kind of the umbrella of the Glisten National Organization. Um, I'm also a teacher. I'm, I teach health. Um, at a high school. I'm also on the school board where I live and um, I'm, I, I do a lot of things. And so today I'm here to kind of talk about some of the work that GLSEN does to support LGBTQ plus students, since that's what we're here for today. Um, and I think I said, my name is Joe Benno and I go by he, him, his as my pronouns. Um, GLSEN is an organization that's been around for a long time. Um, since the 90s, I mean, for us, that's a long time as an organization. Um, and so we do a lot of work on ensuring safe schools and making sure that all students, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity and expression, um, are safe. And we want schools to be safe for all students, all staff, regardless. Glisten does a lot of things. Uh, we're a chapter of a national organization. There's 40 plus chapters around the country. We work with students. We do trainings for educators. Glisten does research that a lot of people use. Um, and we do a lot of policy level at state, local, and um, federal levels. Our Glisten research, our most current one is the 2019 National School Climate Survey. Glisten does a survey where they survey students from all over the country every two years, and they do it in odd years. And then in even years, they release the results. So the 2021 National School Climate Survey is gonna come out this fall. I'm really curious to see what it looks like because it's basically what happened to students virtually. So I'm kind of curious what that study will look like and that'll be available this fall. And we also have a 2019 Washington State snapshot that shows what happened in Washington State. And I'll link that at some point as well. One of the things with GLSEN research found that 86% of LGBTQ plus students were harassed or assaulted at school. And so we know that regardless of how progressive places might be, LGBTQ plus students still are not always safe in the schools that they are at. They're being bullied, they're being harassed, they're being assaulted at school. Um, the research also shows that when we look at the data, one in seven LGBTQ plus students report being physically assaulted in school, specifically due to their sexual orientation, gender, or gender expression. So when we mean physically assaulted, meaning they physically someone put their hands on them and harm them on a school campus, which is devastating to know that that's going on in our schools. And we know that trans students that have it really bad, uh, they're overall more likely than any other LGBTQ plus students to have negative experiences 
specifically when it came to missing school and they miss school to avoid gendered spaces, specifically locker rooms and bathrooms where they feel it's unsafe for them to be. Glissa has done all sorts of research over the years and what they found overall that there's a lot of negative things that happen to queer students in schools. A lot of them drop out of school, they don't finish school, they have lower grades, they have poor attendance, they're more likely to use drugs, they're more likely to be homeless. There's a lot of negative things that happen. And a lot of it stems for what happens to them at school. For a lot of times if home isn't safe for them, school is the only safe place that they have. And if school isn't safe, then they have nowhere to be that's safe for them. And that's why it's so important that we work to create inclusive spaces in schools for students can have at least one safe space in their lives. If it isn't at home, it should be at school. A lot of people think this is a secondary problem. This kind of stuff, bullying, harassment based on gender happens in elementary school, it starts in elementary school and before. This is based on a 2015 study called Playgrounds and Prejudice where they interviewed elementary teachers and students based on what was going on at elementary school. And what they found specifically is if a student is gender non-conforming or doesn't follow traditional gender norms, they're more likely to uh, be bullied or report that uh, people will make fun of their gender. What we also find in elementary school compared to other students, if students are gender non-conforming, they're more likely to be called names or made fun of or bullied. They're also more likely to have mean rumors or lies spread about them at school. They tend to be more likely to miss school because they don't feel safe or don't feel like people like them. And they're less likely to feel like they're very safe or people care about them at school. So for those people who say that this is only a middle school and high school problem, it actually starts way in early elementary school when we look at what happens with the bullying harassment based just on gender. And if we look overall what happens to our students, I always like to say in the training specifically to staff or administrators is that what, what happens when we don't intervene or we don't support students who are being bullied, it creates a hostile school climate. And the things I mentioned earlier, students are more, li more likely to experience depression, anxiety, they're more likely to miss school, they're more likely to have lower self-esteem, they have lower academic achievements, they have a lower sense of belonging at school and lower educational aspirations, which is why the things I mentioned earlier, like the dropouts, the homelessness, et cetera, students don't feel good at school and so they leave school or they leave home to try to find places where they are uh, accepted for who they are. So everything's not gloom and doom. I always say the data is not always great, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's definitely a beacon of hope out there. And, and all the studies that GLSEN has done over the last 10 years, over the last decade, is they found there's four things that schools and districts need to do to create a safe environment for LGBTQ plus students. I would say only four, that's it, only four, easy, right? The first one is having enumerated policies. We're lucky in Washington state that we, by law, all our schools have to have, and our districts have to have enumerated policies. That's a comprehensive list of enumerated categories that specifically names LGBTQ students um, cannot be bullied and harassed based on that identity. And so I always say, hey, check, number one, we got that. Yes, thanks, Washington. Um, but not all schools always enforce it. So that's always something that we need to kind of look at. But having enumerated policies are important because it shows we can show on a list, we don't discriminate based on this. And we can point that out. General non-discrimination policies tend to not work that because they're too vague. But we also find that supportive educators are really important. Educators who show support for LGBTQ plus students, who get trained on how to support students, who wear uh, pronoun buttons, badges, I have a ribbon that says my pronouns. Um, but just having supportive educators that students can visibly see, you can see a safe space sticker, you can see a badge that says that you're here to support students regardless, you can see a trans rainbow or a rainbow flag in the classroom, students will know it's a safe place for them. We also know that having clubs at schools like gender and sexuality alliances or gay straight alliances are important because students, even for that school and they don't feel like school is safe, if there's a GSA on campus, they know at least one room in the school that's going to be safe for them. And the last thing I tends to be the hardest piece, and that's inclusive curriculum, and that there should be positive representations of queer people, history and events in the school curriculum. Um, joy, I always say start with joy. I remember hearing a speaker talk about that, about we shouldn't talk about trauma, we shouldn't focus on the AIDS crisis, we shouldn't focus on bullying harassment, 
We should talk about positive representations of queer people in history and the contributions that they've made to society. I always say that curriculum should be windows and mirrors. Students should be able to look out a window and see everyone in their school community by looking out the window. But I also say that you should be able to look in the mirror and see yourself in the curriculum too. And that curriculum should always be windows and mirrors of everyone in that school community. And so that's something we have to work on. Um, we don't have laws in our state that are supposed to be LGBTQ inclusive. There's other things that we have. We have some work to do in our state when it comes to that. Um, we know that the schools that have GSAs, inclusive curriculum, supportive educators and comprehensive policies tend to have negative school experiences for students that were homophobic or where they felt unsafe. They had higher school staff intervention for name calling, bullying, harassment, and that students tend to have more positive educational outcomes. So these four things really showed in our data were really important for schools to be safe. The more of these you have, the more likely your school is to be safe for all students. Um, we also know that trans students don't necessarily have positive school experiences always. Glisten on our website has some resources about pronouns and other information to support trans students. That's not the purpose of this talk today, but you can go to our website and find some resources on how to support trans and gender non-conforming students in your school campus. Uh, we have things about the gender triangle, which is very similar to what Cassandra shared about the gender unicorn. Uh, you can buy pronoun buttons. There's also model school district policies about how to be more gender and um, trans um, affirming for students, including how you should design bathrooms, locker rooms, and other spaces, and uh, lots of articles about what's going on and what kind of lessons you can use in your classrooms or, or your school environments. Listen, Washington does a lot of great things. We know that a lot of our trainings that we do tend to support supportive educators. We want student, we want educators to be supportive and we want to be able to provide trainings where educators feel empowered to support students in their classrooms where, and administrators can feel like they have the knowledge and skills to support students and staff in their school environments. Um, Glissa offers professional development for um, for a fee, we offer anywhere between one to six hour trainings. You can go to our website and find out more information. Um, the trainings are put on by certified facilitators, and we have lots of different types of workshops we offer. You can find that on our website as well. And the purpose is to kind of aim to foster allyship from educators and figure out how educators can create action plans to support these students. That way, educators have like a piece of something they can do immediately after the training to support their classrooms or their schools. We do a lot of other things. You may have heard of the Rainbow Library Program from Glisten, where we offer a, a box of books to school libraries for free, just by signing up that are age appropriate for the school environment. We've given out over 600 boxes of books in the state um, for libraries. We also have a, a conference we put on every year for educators and students. We give out rainbow tassels for seniors who are graduating. We have a youth council, we call our shine team. and et cetera, et cetera. We have a lot and I don't need to go on more than I need to, but you can go to our website, which is glistenwa or glistenwashington.org and follow us on social media. But ultimately we are here to make sure that uh, schools and districts uh, have the knowledge and training so they can better provide for their students. And that is all for me. All right, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, we have one final video uh, hearing from some students like we did when we started, and um, then we will begin answering some of your questions. And we've answered a couple of them by text um, in the Q&A, uh, but we'll, we'll open them up to our panel in just a moment. So we'll do one more video and then come back for Q&A. Thanks to those of you who have stuck around. School for me is scary. Um, it, it's it's not fun. I, I dread going to school every morning and being in a classroom full of people who do not share the same interests.
school for me is scary. Um, it, it's it's not fun. I, I dread going to school every morning and being in a classroom full of people who do not share the same interests and values that I do. It's scary because I don't know how people are going to perceive me when I dress a certain way or if I present myself a certain way to different people. The school is hard, but uh, it will prevail. I have faith in that. We have had students uh, throw food at us and uh, just uh, we've had students who were on the football team quit the football team because of uh, bullying and harassment. We had um, a problem with our day of silence because there was basically um, some people who decided that it was right to deface our posters and yell at people who were participating in a day of silence. I was involved in uh, freshman orientation and I was actually one of the head ambassadors out of 150 students. I got my privileges revoked because some parent of one of the kids that was in my group called the school and complained that I was their leader and that I was not fit to be a student leader. So it's just really hard. I got involved with GLSEN because I felt that the message that it has is really positive and I want to help spread it around. I started my Gay Straight Alliance because I felt that students needed to uh, be aware that there were LGBT students and to um, to provide support for any LGBT student that might have needed it. We've come a long way in regards to gay rights and equality, but I feel like there's so much more that we can do and I think our generation can accomplish a lot of that. Someday, a kid like me will not go unnoticed per se, but will be able to go through their school district and go through their lives without being nitpicked or bullied. There's no reason for you to ever be told that you can't do something and you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing until it happens because it has to happen and it will. Thank you GLSEN supporters for helping GSAs all over the country. Thank you GLSEN supporters for all the work you've done for LGBT youth. Because of all your work, I am able to feel safe and happy. Thank you for supporting GLSEN. Thank you GLSEN supporters for giving me an opportunity to speak my mind and create a voice for myself in itself to create a better future. All right, that one always gets me. Ah, so that's why we're here. And uh, with that, I'm going to have Jennifer ask some questions that have come in. And um, if we don't get to your question, we will get back to you, but hopefully we'll have time to, got a good good amount of time. And as far as the panelists, just um, feel free to jump in there and answer and add to. So Jennifer, back to you. Okay, so the first question I'm looking at here is, why does my child keep changing pronouns? I can take a stab at that. <laughs> so um, they may just be trying them out. You know, uh, with gender identity, um, a lot of, like at Lambert House, we see kids who literally like, one of my one of my duties at Lamer House is I also correlate data um, as far as like on our Discord server and a lot of these kids they change their names every single day, you know, and it drives me crazy to put this stuff in a spreadsheet, but it's all part of them kind of essentially trying out to see what feels right, um, to see what is their best expression and what suits them best, and you know, it's just a pronoun, you know, it it doesn't hurt. It's they're not. It's not like they went and bought a Ferrari and then want to return it and get a Lambo tomorrow. It's going to be okay. They're just trying out their pronouns. And eventually they'll probably calm down with that and decide on one that best fits uh, what they feel inside and how it matches their outside. Great, thank you. Um, another question I have is about bathrooms. Um, if my, um, let me see if I can find it here. If my uh, child identifies or uses they, them pronouns, it says, um, what bathroom should they use? Ooh, 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 I can answer this. There's, safe, there's state policy and laws about this where students are able to use the restroom based on their gender identity. Um, and that schools have to have designated uh, bathrooms. If it's not a single stall gender neutral bathroom, there has to be another designated restroom that students can use, but they ultimately 
can use the bathroom that matches their gender identity, regardless of uh, gender neutral or not. So that's law. And uh, students who are not comfortable with that, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't matter that other students don't feel comfortable because the student it's, uh, who is queer is protected based on state policies. Yeah, and I want to say that unfortunately in practice, I, I did see there, there was a comment on um, why there's not a gender neutral bathroom at Timberline, which from my understanding, there's a lot of the schools that technically do, but it's often the nurse's office that they need to get a key or they need to, you know, go to the front desk, or they need to talk to a counselor for it, which is just a whole other step to just use the restroom um, and is already such, um, you know, students, young people will often end up with like UTIs and like things like that from literally holding, from using the restroom. Um, so yeah, definitely more um, easily accessible um, gender neutral bathrooms is amazing and then yeah, of course, under Washington state law, every student has the right to use whatever bathroom aligns with their gender identity. And I always say also that if people don't like their district policies, they can have their school board members change them, where in any new construction or renovations that they automatically add gender neutral bathrooms next to the gendered bathrooms or renovate the, the, the gendered bathrooms are there currently and just put in individual single stall toilets instead of having like one room with a bunch of toilets. You could have several different rooms with single doors on the toilets. So there's different ways that, and the Glisten model policy talks about several ways you can um, renovate bathrooms, et cetera, that are more gender inclusive. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of things may be prohibited or hindered by school district policies or school board policies. So that would be a place to go and um, get them to change them. Run for school board. That's what I, my suggestion to all allied parents, run for school board. They have more power than you think they do. I'm there and it's hard sometimes as a school board director to get some of the things passed, right? So, but it's yeah, definitely it's great advice. Okay, I think this is a somewhat related question, but on a slightly different angle. Um, if my child has a teacher that refuses to use their name and pronouns, um, what should I do? Under what Joe was talking about, under the same, the student has every right to use their correct name and pronoun in school. They can change it in Skyward. Um, unfortunately, often that does mean that their parents will know as well. Um, so if that's something that they're not comfortable with or out with, that is unfortunately um, a reality, but they can still advocate for themselves um, or often in Pizza Clash, this is something that we talk about a lot, how to do it. And we've gone to counselors together to talk to the counselor about it with. And um, often it ends up with that student being transferred out of a class into a different one, which isn't the most ideal, right? Because that's not actually the addressing the issue itself. It's removing them from the situation, which isn't quite the best, but it is an option. Um, and yeah, reminding them that, and you know, I think this falls a lot on, on admin um, and other school personnel for reminding their staff and students that they need to respect all their students. Um, and that that is part of that. Um, names and pronouns are a very baseline sort of show of respect. And also most school districts should have policies. If um, you've talked to the teacher and they're still misgendering you or calling you the wrong name, you've talked to administrators, generally the school board policy and reporting and reporting actions and a way of uh, educators are not supporting your pronouns is a way to report them as well, where that's required by the school district administration then to investigate and um, deal with the issue if it's not being handled at the building levels. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Here's another one. If my child is elementary school, is that too early for them to be thinking about their sexual orientation or gender identity? I mean, I always say it's never too early, but ultimately if we look at like age appropriateness, what we found in research is most most children begin to, young, young children begin to know what their gender identity is by the time they're in elementary school. Most students during puberty are able to kind of figure out what their sexual orientation is 
like when we look at like statistics, that's not always like perfectly set. It could happen at any time. But what I always say is that regardless of what their gender identity or their orientation is, it's just making sure that whatever environment they're in, it's safe so they can explore and talk about that. And, you know, that's not even limited. Youth are exposed to and talked about sexuality and gender all the time in other ways. Um, that being cisgender and heterosexuality. This, these are things that culturally are put onto youth from the day they're born, basically. So there is already that conversation, um, but this is the shift to make it more inclusive and to make it that there are other ways of being in the world. There are other ways to identify romantically, um, sexually, gender-wise, um, that it isn't just this option. Um, Cause that's just, that's happening on its own as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think this is the last one I have. And then Courtney, I'll pass it over to you if you have a, a few additional ones on your end. Um, my child has been talking about using a binder and I am concerned that binders are dangerous. I know probably maybe not everyone watching knows what a binder is. So explaining that too would just be a suggestion I would have, thanks. So a binder is normally uh, something a um, male presenting child will use to repress their breast development. Um, it's essentially, imagine a corset that goes up higher. Um, a real binder is safe. Um, they can be a little uncomfortable, but they actually even sell them at Target now. You can literally walk into a Target store and buy a binder for a child now, which is amazing. Um, the problem that we see a lot of times is kids who need binders and can't afford them or they're, they're too embarrassed to ask their kids, uh, their parents to buy them one is they'll use things like ACE bandages instead, uh, which are very dangerous for kids because they continually retract and then all of a sudden the kid can't breathe and then falls over and they can't figure out why. And of course, then it was a different embarrassing situation for the kid adding more trauma. So, um, yeah, binders are safe and they're essentially to try to bring their body into more of an alignment, the silhouette to what they see as their gender identity. But, you know, if you're going to buy your child one, definitely buy a, a good one, but make a real binder, sports bras. Sometimes I see kids wear like multiple sports bras and that can be uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, you can go to Target literally right now, get in your car and go buy a binder. I just want to add to as a little will caveat asterisk there that yes, binders are safe as long also as you're not, as they're not wearing them for over eight hours, um, not exercising, not sleeping with them. Um, and also making sure to keep it clean. Um, something that, you know, might not be thinking about, but keeping it clean is important as well. Um, yeah, just that little, little addition there. Kids are dirty sometimes y'all it happens. <laughs> yeah. As a middle school teacher, I definitely, <laughs> That. All right, that's all my questions, Courtney. So I'll pass it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And uh, some of these are specific to um, that we might need to have to have you talk to a, a, one of our district administrators, but I'll, I'll attempt it and then um, we can get your email. Um, one person asked, where can I find the info that is being taught to each grade level? when it comes to pronouns, LGBTQ+, plus, sexuality, et cetera? And my first answer would be OSPI, but I'm gonna turn to Joe and Jennifer and others, Antonio, of where for our school district, um, it's probably on our website somewhere, but anybody wanna take a stab at that? I mean, you're correct. Like state standards are on OSPI, specifically if you look at health, um, health education standards, which I was on the committee for, um, looks at sexual health is on there where they specifically talk about gender and sexual orientation is on there for K through 12. So they can look at that, but not all the school districts adopt all of the standards from all of the subjects that are on OSPI. So that would be district specific. So I can only answer about OSPI. I would say, and feel free to correct me if I am wrong, Antonio, um, other than health, there is not any mandated inclusive LGBTQIA plus curriculum 
in our district. I was part of an equity advisory team committee where we developed some curriculum around elementary school storybooks. So that is available on the district equity website, I believe. Um, but in the secondary level, other than health, there is no standardized curriculum. I would reach out to my um, school to find out what's being taught at that individual school. Because honestly, I think there is um, quite a bit of variance between the schools based on teachers and administrators. Yes, Jennifer is definitely correct for Northeastern. We do not have a standardized curriculum for this. Um, there are times such as in the month of June, Pride Month, where we would do some lessons around this subject and they would be posted on the equity website, but there is not a standardized curriculum for it. Thanks very much. Um, this person asked about a policy protecting our kids, but there's no specific sanctions that are designated against repeat offenders. They've spoken to one of our administrators about this. How does a policy help our kids when the same students bully our youth? And not knowing the specifics, but um, you know, maybe in general, some of you could, could talk to that and we could find out more about the policy of which you're speaking. I can go into like generics. Um, people probably won't like it, but ultimately, it's um, the HIB policy, the harassment, intimidation, and bullying policy is an unfunded mandate by OSPI. So it requires districts to report any incidences of bullying that's going on. Unfortunately, from what I've heard, and, and I don't know what goes on in North Thurston, because I'm a guest, is that some administrators across the state, if they call it bullying, they have to do paperwork. And so if the same student is doing the bullying, they have to fill out paperwork so they can track which student is doing it. It's a lot of paperwork, so some administrators won't call it bullying. They'll call it, there was an incident, something happened, there was an altercation, so they won't have to call it bullying. And ultimately, it's up to the school administrators. And I don't want to sound like I'm talking bad about the school administrators because I don't know what goes on in your district. But ultimately, there might be some shortcuts that are taken that is not properly uh, reporting the bullying that's actually going on in the school. So that could be something that is going on um, in your district that I don't, I'm not sure about. Yes, um, I can follow up with that. Joe, you're definitely correct. That has been happening. And what we did this year, just back in March, we, we did our um, HIP form, the harassment, intimidation, and bullying, and made it more specific to what type of harassment and bullying is occurring, not just general, for this very reason. So the administrators now can exactly address that this was a hate crime or a sexual harassment crime toward a person of, um, from the Q, Q community. <laughs> So we also have a progressive discipline policy in the district. So when there is a repeat offender, that there are steps in, in, in place that will um, address that with more disciplinary um, action from the school administration. Thank you. Um, I think Sophia already addressed this one. Why don't we have a all gender bathroom at Timberline? I know that there are steps that the district's taking as we build new construction. Um, but according to state law right now, schools aren't required to have all inclusive gender neutral bathrooms. I know Seattle Public Schools is looking at that or doing that. Joe's nodding his head, but um, uh, it definitely is something, um, you know, talk to your school administrator about. If you're not comfortable with that, talk to your GSA advisor. Um, email the equity department, you know, we, we want to help kids get the bathrooms that they need. Um, this is one about a policy. Um, somebody wasn't expelled for their actions. So I would encourage uh, the person, I'm not going to name you, um, to really reach out and contact the equity department about the, the issues you're experiencing if it's around bullying. Um, uh, we would like to know about those and talk to the administrator and see what we can do. So it's equity at in Thurston, right, Antonio, .k12 .us. So, um, or you can call the district office and ask for the equity department. Um, are there any tips to pass as male for a female to male person? I would probably suggest joining a, um, a community organization 
with other trans youth if you can't even if it's online uh place like lambert house simple plug down here um a, a lot of trans masculine kids in there and they're likely to give you tips a uh, binding is probably the big one um if you don't have access uh you know, are, are not ready yet to medically transition. And that's one of those things too, it's important to point out that I forgot to say that, you know, a lot of kids who are trans, they don't ever take a hormone. They don't want gender affirming surgery. So that's okay too. And, uh, but it is really important for any youngsters. I know how frustrating it can be to want access to those things and not have them right away, but it's very important not to use those things unless you're under a doctor's supervision, um, you're under a therapist's supervision because they, they affect your brain as much as they affect your body. And if things aren't tested correctly, they, you can have very, very terrible results. You know, a lot of trans people in the 60s used to die like at 21, 22 because they weren't under a doctor's care. So um, keep that in mind. Sometimes you may have to wait a little while. And I know that's frustrating but you'd rather be safe than sorry and do it correctly uh, rather than the wrong way and face a lifetime of consequences. But um, I would strongly recommend getting with a peer group, either an after school gay straight alliance and talking to your other fellow uh, female to male trans dudes um, and bro it out and get some uh, conversations going because that will definitely help. Anything else? Thank Where can I find, no, we covered that one. Um, is there a resource for what to say when? I know allyship is all about recruiting more allies, but it's hard sometimes not to retort angrily to ugliness. I get sweary in my head. I mean, the organization I work with, Glisten, has a resource that's called What to Say when someone says that's so gay, but there's a bunch of other iterations of that document all over. I know Glisten, we have something called the Safe Space Kit, and there's a guide in there on how to be an ally. That's one of the trainings that we do is how to create safer environments with that Safe Space Kit. Um, I'm gonna plug it a little bit, but it's this document. Um, and in here, there's a bunch of resources specifically about what to say when and how to create a safer environment and how to be an ally. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of time to go in there, but there is the resource on the GLSEN website, or if you Google safe space kit, you can find the quick information there, or you can reach out to me if you have questions or want more information about that. But I know there's a, I, I know my organization because that's who I work with, but I know there's a lot of great organizations that have other resources that are very similar. Thanks, Joe. Uh... All right, is there a list of local providers who are affirming or provide gender care? Yes, and it's a bit out of date pre-COVID, at least the pizza clutch one specifically that we have been using or going off of, you know, therapists have stopped practicing with the state, um, new therapists have come in. So um, I have started working on a new one um, that is a little bit more up to date because at least I haven't seen any ones that are pretty up to date and comprehensive. If I'm incorrect, please send it my way. Um, but yeah, hopefully um, I'll be able to do that in the next couple of weeks. Um, you can email me at sophia pizzaclatch.org. I know that um, Psychology Today has a website where you can actually look for specific. Um, uh, providers and you can search by trans or LGBT, et cetera. And then and you can look for local therapists or providers. Um, that's been the most outside like local resource. That's been the most accurate, best resource I can find specifically for providers. Uh, I know that local one is good. I know Sophia is talking about that, but I know local would be best, but this is when I send people to because there's not a really great statewide or local one that I've seen. Even as an organization, we've talked about creating one too. So Sophia, we should collaborate. Yeah, and I also, with the caveat as well, that, you know, anyone can put on LGBT free friendly, LGBTQ friendly on the thing. So always making sure to interview your therapist and see where they're at and see if it's a, a good fit. 
overall right now, there's a kind of a crisis of getting to see a therapist just because of COVID and a lot of people for all sorts of reasons. Um, I will also plug that UW has a gender affirming care clinic on campus. Um, and there's a place called the Q Center if you're at UW campus, which is not just open to students. So um, it is a resource that is available um, to folks. Um, you can definitely reach out to them and they can send you and keep you at kind of a meet, an intermediary. Sorry, I have braces. Uh, <laughs> some words are hard to say, um, but that's definitely very helpful. I think the biggest frustration a lot of time is if a kid is in crisis and trying to see a therapist who specifically deals with gender identity, it can be a weight and that can be very hard. So that's when I would definitely use you know, Glencine, PFLAG, Lambert House, Peachy Kitch, use those resources in the meantime as your crutch until you can sit down with the gender therapist. Because a lot of times I've had a lot of kids who get in a crisis because they're the, the kids are like, I need to see a therapist. And they send them to a therapist that doesn't know anything about gender identity and totally misdiagnosed. So I was like, oh, well, you're just, you know, you just have these other problems. And the kid is like, no, it's, you know, so um, it's definitely worth the wait and definitely check their credentials and make sure they're, for lack of a better term, not a crackpot. So, you know, <laughs> choose wisely. For those of you who aren't uh, Huskies, but are Cougars, I know that WSU also has a, a gender center as well, too, that does similar work. Go Huskies. All right, we have a few minutes left and I know there's a couple questions that were really specific um, to some issues with the school discipline and, and um, I'm gonna encourage you to email Dr. Sanderfer and um, see if we can, um, sometimes it's hard, you talk to a lot of people and you feel like you're not getting the answers, but we're here tonight um, to address those issues and and provide you lots of resources. So um, uh, hopefully if you if you did not get something written down or you have follow-up questions, um, we'll be posting this on our uh, district YouTube page. It may take a couple days. Um, you could also email equity at um, inthurston.k12.wa.us or uh, you can call, I don't have Antonio's phone number memorized, but you could call the front desk at 412 4400, 412, 4400, and ask for the equity department. And Dana, Cassandra, Diane, Jennifer, Joe, Antonio, and Sophia, thank you so much for being here tonight. And thank you for everybody who attended. Um, we really appreciate your questions. And hopefully, this was a good resource and hope that you can join us on June 2nd at the Community Cafe. Have a good night, everybody, and we'll see you later. Bye bye.